Morbid curiosity is like a fiber of every human's sense of being and purpose. Like we have morbid curiosities about things, such as when we find out somebody dies, what's one of the first things we always want to ask? Why? What happened? Because we're morbidly curious. And when you look at what happened at Revolution on Sunday, my God, that was spectacular. Oh, no, 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 not the show itself. That finish. It was a sparkling good time. And I'm so glad I watched that whole event because everything leading up to that moment made that moment so perfect. Like, if you paid the $50 to watch that pay-per-view, if you streamed it on Sunday night, it doesn't matter. You got to watch wrestling history. You have good shows. You have great shows that people will remember, well, this is a good or a great show, but they hardly remember the specifics or the details. What happened there in that main event, in that sparkler bomb on Sunday, you will never, a a a ever forget. And if you agree with me, you should smash that subscribe button and follow the show on Twitter. A lot of us were morbidly curious to see what AEW was going to do on Dynamite Wednesday to address that. Like, how are they going to recover from that? Yeah, personally, like, hey, that was one of the most hilarious experiences I've ever seen in a pay-per-view. And for those of you wondering, does it get up to uh, Sin 2001 levels? Uh, pretty close. I don't know if it could get to that level because there's a backstory there involving Psycho Sid and Johnny Ace. That just puts it over the top. But by God, this is pretty close to it. It was fantastic. So, of course, AEW, the first thing they do is they trot out some stupid sucks of bucks of sucks match. That's how we're going to get it right. We're going to go back to the wrestlings. Oh, Ray Phoenix, Matt Jackson, a lot of you geeked out to this. I thought it was dumb. Nobody gives a shit about this. At least you could say it had purpose. There's a reason, because Phoenix and Pac are top contenders now for the Bucks of Sucks tag titles. So it had purpose. You know, and you want things to have purpose on these shows, especially when you only have two hours of prime time every week. Everything on your channel, or everything on your show each week, should have purpose. This has a purpose. You are trying to tell a story. Doesn't mean I give a shit about it. Doesn't mean I want to see these stupid flippy kicking matches. What we should have started off the show with instead was what came next which was Eddie Kingston and John Moxley addressing the whole Sparklers of Doom incident on Sunday night. Fantastic. This should have kicked off the show. This is the best possible spin that you could put on this. Not Tony Khan trying to sit there and be the money mark nerd that he is and trying to sit there and get defensive about it Sunday night in the post-show press conferences. Like, let the guys that actually know what the fuck they're doing get this over and get you the hell on from it. Like Eddie Kingston's talking about how it's triggering his anxiety, going back to his days and thinking he was going to get thrown, get threatened by the cops to be thrown into Rikers or Sing Sing. Like, okay, you buy that because it's coming from Eddie Kingston. And then you throw your one of your business partners under the bus. Did Impact pay for the bomb? <laughs> We're still doing money jokes about Impact Wrestling in 2021 and it will always be appropriate. Moxley talking about there were more explosive volcanoes that he put together in fourth grade science class. Like, this was terrific. It was two minutes, 45 seconds of perfect justification and perfect everything to try and move the hell on from that. Like, this should have kicked off the show. This is the thing that everybody wanted to see. To go right into it. Fuck a match. Matches can wait. And we certainly could have done without the next match. It was Cody versus a big jobber. Now, help me understand this. When Cody faces a Peter Avalon or some other midget jobber, excuse me, excuse me, some other small jobber, he works 50-50 competitive matches like a dumb fuck. But now that he's facing some big giant all of a sudden or somebody that's his size or bigger, he's just got to squash him. And when you look at crap like that and you look at the entrances and you say all the budget money for Pyro goes to Cody's overdone ass entrances instead of for everything else, you know, Cody, Jared, I'm starting to wonder about you a little bit. As far as the whole thing about Penta El Cero, calling him out, whatever. I like the jab at him about Brandy. That's cool, but kind of odd. But for Penta, maybe a good spot for him to be in. Uh, the Sting interview. Like, we're just starting to digest what happened with that street fight at Revolution. 
and now they're teasing something with Sting and Lance Archer? Really? Like, why not instead tease a one-on-one -on -one match with one of the members of Team Taz? There's not necessarily a reason that you have to end that story. I mean, don't get me wrong. We all know why Sting is there. And we know, it's coming! It's coming! It's coming! Keep it warm, Kenny! Keep it warm, Christian! You know where that belongs before the end of the year. Uh, Ethan Page versus Lee Johnson. You got the whole thing involving QT Marshall and... Uh, Dustin Rhodes and the Nightmare. It's like, who cares? You're more focused on that than trying to get over the new guy you just brought in and ego Ethan Page. Why? Because it brings the bigger questions. Why'd you bring in yet another dude that's ultimately going to get lost in the schmaz? I, I don't get it. Like, there are things that this company does in terms of their weekly television product that are just really mind blowing to me, mind numbing. Uh, you had Don Callis and Kenny Omega out there with the Good Brothers. And Don Callis did a good job of trying to sell it. And Kenny Omega, being the dork that he is, almost ruined it. Because just like the women's division, he's a, a horrible booker. He's a horrible world champion. He absolutely is. Like, he should have said nothing here. He should have kept his mouth shut the whole time. Because let the people with actual talent on the microphone, like Don Callis, try to talk you out of that. Try to get you out of that situation. Would have preferred if they just not addressed it at all. Whatever. And eventually Kingston comes out. He's facing them down. And then, let's get past all that stuff that doesn't matter. The big deal is, somebody's going to outwork everyone and it's Christian Cage. And by God, we're going to send him at the champ, Kenny Omega. Go big or go home, I guess. I mean, the way Paul White had hyped it up the previous week, like this was a big deal and it was a big signing. They were bringing in a Hall of Fame worthy person. You know, if you're going to put that type of smoke behind it, then you might as well get a little sizzle and fire. Why not send Christian directly at Kenny Omega? Because Christian actually knows what the fuck he's doing. Christian could be someone similar uh, that can actually help Kenny Omega tell a story in the ring. Like it could be a good counterbalance. It could be a good fit in terms of a program and in terms of the actual matches. Like when you look at Moxley and Omega, the stipulation of the match on Sunday at Revolution forced them to tell a story and they told a really good story and it exploded in orgasmic euphoric ecstasy at the end with that payoff. Oh God, that was a payoff. Like I could just sit here and spend 15 minutes talking about the magnificence of that payoff in and of itself. But uh, Christian, all I'll say is this, is you might have eyes on the prize, but just remember, you're just keeping it warm for somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, this six-woman tag. Maki Ito singing during the beginning of the match was funny. Her mic shots to the head of Sheeta were a joke. That was really, really bad. Like, we should stop putting people on TV that can't execute basic fundamental things like is she afraid she was going to break the mic? Did she think the fans wanted an encore there? I don't know what the fuck. And furthermore, here's what I don't understand. Why in the fuck did you do a whole tournament AEW just to identify Rio as a contender just so that way you could throw a meaningless, nobody gives a shit about contender at a meaningless, nobody gives a shit champion in Sheeta. Just so that way you could have Sheeta retain the championship and then she's not even a primary focus of this fucking match anyways. I guess dumb. Is Sheeta fucking pounding nasties with Kenny Omega? Did she set up Kenny with her brother or uncle or something? Like, how the hell does she continue to have this strap? She does nothing. Like, this is where you clearly see the problems of having Kenny Omega booking this women's division. You know what the fuck he's doing. You get to the part about Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa, though, that was really good. And then you find out that they're main eventing Dynamite next week, and you're like, okay, fantastic. The ladies are getting a little bit of a break here. And you have enough of a story here with between Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa, two ladies that you should be building your women's division around for the next several years, not fucking Joshi wrestler A, B, and C that D's fans don't give two shits about. These are some of the ladies that you should be building around. Which again begs the question, these two ladies, neither one of them being the champion, 
our main event in Dynamite. Why in the hell is Akaru Shida still your women's champion? That's stupid. This main event should be showcasing these two ladies and they should be fighting for the title next week, period. Of uh, the TNT Championship, like the biggest thing there, like they kind of worked the Darby hurt his ankle mid-match thing for a couple of minutes and of course eventually we just went to the same shit we always do. Uh, but we finally got the Scorpio Sky character turn, the heel turn. And it felt like they were starting to tease us a little bit, um, especially before the pay-per-view. Like he came across kind of heelish on the commentary. Like, cool. I think a lot of people like Scorpio Sky, but they also look at him and say, he's missing something. And he is. He's missing an edge to his character. He's missing some type of shtick, some type of appeal. And getting him the hell away from Kaz's Daniels as much as you possibly can is a perfect way to help him find his personality and find his true wrestling self. And that, if anything else, is the big deal here. You know, Darby might still be your TNT champion, but now Scorpio Sky's heel, and now you're potentially launching off to the story there. Cool beans with me. So there were some good things that happened on this show. It wasn't all shit, that's for sure. But by God, none of that really matters, because when you get to the main event, like this was fantastic. Just flat out fantastic. If you hated this, you either A, just don't like anything that AEW does no matter what, B, just want to be difficult and different just for the sake of being difficult and different, or C, uh, you don't care about these things that actually move the needle, you just want to see flips and kicks and all the other dumb crap that doesn't. Because this main event... This was fantastic. This inner circle war council. Like what I love about this was how it spun everybody and it had twists all throughout. Like you're thinking first thing, it's kind of getting teed up. Like you're thinking this is where MJF's going to get the other members to turn on Jericho. And here comes Sammy Guevara and Sammy Guevara is showing Chris Jericho some footage that shows that all these guys were talking about it behind his back. And then Chris Jericho's saying, Oh, you thought you had one over on me, but I worked you. We knew we didn't trust you from day one, and we just brought you in, but we knew this was going to happen. And then it looks like you're going from everybody in Inner Circle turning on Jericho to everybody in Inner Circle turning on MJF to all of a sudden, just when you get to that payoff, that ultimate moment where you think the heel, in this case MJF, is going to get his comeuppance, now you get the big reveal that he's been working behind the scenes to build his own faction and shit. It goes dark. And here's freaking FDR. Here's Sean Spears. Here's freaking Tully Blanchard. You got your own horseman type of fucking faction. Like, this was fantastic. You think it's going one way, then it goes another way, and then it ultimately goes in an entirely different direction than the vast majority of people were anticipating. It is really hard to swerve people in today's professional wrestling world. Because either everything is too predictable or everybody just leaks everything out there anyways. So to be able to tune in and be legitimately surprised and legitimately enthralled with what was going on was an incredibly refreshing feeling. And now you can sit there and say, that's what AEW needs is one more fucking faction to which I would say, yeah, you got a point. You got too many schmazes of effing bodies as it is. We really don't need one more. But now, when you talk about you've got inner circle, Sammy Guevara's back in the fold, it's Jericho, Santana, Ortiz, Hager, now you've got FTR, you've got Sean Spears, you've got Tully, you've got MJF leading it, you're going to have certainly the Batista Light and Wardlow. Like, you have factions that should be able to have months of programming and months of story. Like, this should carry you through the majority of 2021, which should ultimately culminate at some point in time this year with MJF as the leader of that faction becoming the AEW World Champion. If you don't do that, that is a tremendous waste of time and a huge, huge, huge lost opportunity. Because that's what you're setting up for, and that's what this should be. I loved it. I loved every minute of how this main event played out. And you could tell that it was Jericho that was involved in this segment because he kind of has an idea of what the fuck he's doing. He's not Cody. He's not the Bucks of Suck. And he's not Omega. He knows what the hell he's doing. And you could tell. Like, this was really well done. You guys let me know what you thought about it. Like, how much it surprised you, how cool you or think it is or won't. But, you know, if anything else, it gave me a cliffhanger because now I want to see what happens next week. So AEW twice in a week gave me a cliffhanger. The Sparklers of Doom... Maybe want to tune into Dynamite. 
Now Dynamite's main event made me want to tune in next week. That's how this shit should be done.